Hi, everybody. Welcome this evening uh, to our third webinar for the Beef Quality Assurance Program in New York State. Um, I see a few familiar faces that have connected up this evening. Um, I will just give a quick shout out here to our two presenters. Uh, we have Lynn, Bliv Lynn Bliven, my extension colleague uh, to the south of me in Allegheny County. And we have Catherine Stager, <coughs> excuse me, with the Beef Council, New York Beef Council. They'll both go into a little more introductions, but I just kind of wanted to welcome everybody. Um, as of the 1st of October, I have I have taken over as co-coordinator and I'm working with Catherine on the Beef Quality Assurance Program for the state. So I will mute myself, turn off my video, and let, I guess, Lynn and Catherine take over. We um, do have a, a chat box down at the bottom of your screen and we will, if it's a pertinent question to whoever's presenting, we can stop and I'll read it. Um, otherwise, we'll save some for the end. So thanks again for joining us and we'll get the show started. Thanks, Nancy. Um, Again, Lynn Bliven, I work with uh, Allegheny County Extension and I do a lot with beginning farmers and livestock production. Happy to be able to share with you a little bit this evening and uh, have some conversation about uh, finishing cattle. Uh, I've raised uh, commercial Angus and Red Angus for a number of years and in 2012 uh, I took advantage of the prices of cattle and sold off and we got into some registered Herefords. Uh, so that's kind of what we're raising now and we still uh, grass finish uh, a few steers a year, but primarily are have moved into the uh, selling and breeding uh, stock now. So it's a little bit about me and I'll go ahead and turn it over to Catherine. Good evening, everyone. We're excited to have you join us this evening. Um, as mentioned earlier, my name is Catherine Steger and I work with the New York Beef Council. I am our director of producer communications and influencer outreach. And uh, with my role with the Beef Council, we are funded by the Beef Checkoff. So we are responsible for collecting the Beef Checkoff here in New York and delivering programs and educational efforts um, to New Yorkers all across the state. So in my role, I primarily focus my time on working with um, influencers and anyone from chefs to registered dietitians, um, food bloggers and teachers providing them with opportunities to get on farms, connect with farmers, and learn more about what it is that you all do uh, to answer their questions about where their beef comes from and um, how to cook it and enjoy it. But the other side of my job is also working on our producer communications as we are fully funded by uh, beef farmers and dairy farmers through the checkoff. And in that role, I serve as the co-coordinator for the BQA program, as Nancy mentioned. So the Beef Quality Assurance Program here in New York is uh, very robust in our offerings and that has a lot to do with the number of different entities that help make this program possible. The Beef Quality Assurance Program is a national program that's funded by the Beef Checkoff. Um, but here in New York, it takes a lot of hands to get it delivered um, to make in-person hands-on training possible. So the New York Beef Council partners with Cornell University and Dr. Mike Baker, um, as well as our local, your local extension offices in order to host in-person trainings um, and offered continued education. We also partner with the New York Beef Producers Association and the New York State Cattle Health Assurance Program in order to make sure that we're continuing, continuously offering um, educational opportunities and promoting educational opportunities that can build off of the primary BQA certification. So I know many of you are likely um, here today to receive your recertification, but for those of you who um, maybe haven't gone through the Beef Quality Assurance certification yet, or maybe not in many years, I just wanted to review really quick because the program is quite robust. It covers a lot more than just uh, injection sites or withdrawal periods. Um, we talk about behavior and handling, record keeping, all the way down to a brand new program that was launched about two years ago that's specifically for cattle transporters and um, truckers. 
So if you are raising cattle or transporting cattle, I encourage you to um, get your beef quality assurance training certification. I'm going to talk a little bit later about some of the additional benefits to that in terms of your marketing. Um, but if you haven't started that yet, I would go to bqa.org to get it started, or you can find information about in-person trainings here in New York um, on the New York Beef Council website under our Farmer Expense Post. For those of you who are using this webinar as a recertification opportunity, recertification is required every three years. And the goal is to really build off of the information that's shared in your original certification. Uh, so we're happy to have you here if, if you are pursuing your recertification, uh, but just attending is not um, going to get you your certification just yet. We will need a signed contract and a recertification form. And that's because we want to ensure that you have taken the opportunity to review the principles of the Beef Quality Assurance Program and kind of recommit to um, taking those actions to produce the highest quality beef. In order to get recertification, you also have to attend continued education, which you're probably familiar with part of why you're here. Um, but there's a lot of opportunities of how to get that certification. You can also have a herd health consultation with your veterinarian. There is an online opportunity um, through New York Beef Council's website at nybeef.org. And any kind of educational opportunity, whether it be through, um, you know, your local feed salesman talking about nutrition or mineral salesman, as well as working with your veterinarian. Here in New York, we have a program that goes a little bit above and beyond what um, the national certification requires, and that's what we call our New York State Level 2. So for to either get or maintain a Level 2 certification, you will need to also have a vet client patient relationship form on record here at the New York Beef Council, and that just allows us to document that you do have a relationship with and are continuing to work with a herd veterinarian to um, ensure your herd health protocols. So if you have any questions about getting certified or recertifying, please feel free to reach out to me um, and we can get any questions that you have answered. With that, I'm gonna turn things over to Lynn to kick us off with tonight's presentation. Great, thank you, Catherine. So we wanted to start out with uh, just some uh, conversations about things that we might need to be thinking about pre-harvest. And Oh, sorry, I thought I could advance them. I didn't. Thank you. Uh, so really thinking about, um, you know, I, I guess to start off with is you really need to think about who your customer is. Uh, how, you know, depending on what your customer is or if you have multiple types of customers or venues that you're selling, that's gonna determine you know, whether or not you can uh, have your animals processed at a custom exempt or whether or not you need to be uh, looking at uh, USDA. So if you're planning to sell retail cuts at a farmer's market or uh, packages or bundles, mixing, you know, maybe some beef with some other species, you know, and just doing individual, um, you know, small quantities uh, for retail sale, or if you want to sell into restaurants, uh, you do need to have uh, USDA processing. And so that's gonna be something to consider ahead of time. And it may have some impacts on certainly the timing or the type of animals that you um, are going to be producing. So uh, taste, of course, is the number one reason that people buy beef. And so there is some variability in you know, taste and texture depending on anim how animals are finished. Uh, but uniformity, uh, I think, is something that we want to think about. How can we do a consistent job of providing um, you know, cuts that are the right size, uh, that are uniform in, in marbling, uh, consistency uh, in the quantity would be another issue. So, uh, you know, if you're selling to your, uh, you know, a, a freezer trade, uh, perhaps that's not uh, the same issue as if you're selling to, again, a wholesale outlet or, or a restaurant where they need to have availability year round. And so that will take a little bit uh, different level of planning, you know, generally speaking in, in New York where um, you know, we're spring calving and we're, we're finishing animals in the fall. Uh, and so if you're looking at a restaurant trade, uh, that requires maybe year-round availability of products. And are you willing to adjust your um, style of, of 
management in order to be able to meet those uh, objectives. So uh, next slide, Catherine. So there certainly are some things that we can do from uh, both selection of the live animals that we have on our farm uh, through the types of production uh, factors that we uh, can manage based on um, our own goals and our own farms. Uh, every farm is unique and so there isn't a right answer, uh, but there are, there are certainly things that are important in order to make sure that we have a quality meat product regardless of how we're selling it. And so there are some considerations you know, based on the size of the animals. Uh, it may not be you know, necessarily that it's the right breed, that may be uh, the right genetics within a breed. So how are you planning to finish your animals? Uh, what type of uh, feed availability do you have? Uh, those kind of things that would be important. Um, certainly things like average daily gain is important. We want consistent growth in our animals. Uh, it's better to have you know, a consistent steady growth than to you know, put them out on good quality forage when we have a growing season and perhaps we don't have good store feeds and our animals lose weight. Uh, and that uh, uh, gaining and then losing can actually um, be a negative impact on, on the quality. Um, age, we want to have, you know, animals that we can finish, um, you know, preferably under 30 months of age um, for, for twofold, obviously for, for the age of the, of the animal, but also for the economics so we don't have to take them through a second winter. Uh, temperament can certainly have an impact. Uh, animals that are a little bit flightier. Uh, tend to have, you know, can have some issues with uh, either, um, you know, tenderness or perhaps they create uh, man other management issues in our, in our herds uh, because one flighty animal can kind of have an impact on, on the whole group. Um, finishing, you know, so gender may have a little bit difference, you know, uh, heifers tend to, to finish a little bit lighter. We might manage them a little bit differently. Um, and then there are some other things that we can consider based on Again, the quality of feed, do we have good pasture? How many days are they gonna be on feed? And then uh, uh, certainly dietary fat is another in, um, indicator that's important for quality finishing of feed of muscle. Um, wanted to talk a little bit, uh, we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, and not to, to make uh, everybody uh, need to be uh, a gr cattle grader, but it seemed important that in order for us to understand uh, how we can get an animal finished properly, uh, we need to start with understanding what kind of animals we have on on our farm or what kind of animals we're buying in. So selecting, having an idea of how to select the, the frame size. So in looking at those individual animals and understanding that regardless of how we're finishing, whether we're you know doing grade, grade, grass fed or we're doing grain finished, we really need to understand what type of cattle we have uh, in raising in, in order to get an accurate or proper weight uh, to provide, you know, a finished product um, and get get that uh, choice uh, grading, uh, if that's what our, our goal is, uh, based on the uh, size of the animal. So larger framed animals, the, these are going to be a little bit longer bodied, um, more of a rectangular shape, uh, and they're animals that, you know, the steers are going to finish at over 1,250 pounds, and then our heifers are going to be at 1,150 or plus. Uh, we get into our medium frame. These are going to be uh, animals that are going to finish, and you can see there's quite a range there. So those steers are going to finish between 1,100 and 1,250 pounds. Uh, this again, we're looking at these animals finishing at choice. So obviously, if they're closer to that 1,100, they're probably going to be in the low choice. And as they move up through that weight, that's going to put them into to uh, you know high choice. Uh, again, these are you know uh, goals for uh, generally, a choice finishing is where we want to be. That's where it's going to be a good uh, taste and eating experience for our customers. And if you're selling live animals um, or need to move some of your animals uh, in a live market, that's also going to be the most economical for you to be finishing that right. Uh, so uh, as we get into the next one, when we're talking about these small framed animal, these are going to be a little bit more boxy, uh, lighter weights. Uh, you know, we need to think about, you know, the genetics. Is this something that we really want to have? If this is what you have now, obviously knowing what need, you know, the, the weights that you're going to finish in the mat is important. But thinking about um, sometimes we can get almost too small a frame uh, for the economics of finishing that animal. It costs as much to, to take them to market as it does um, a large or medium framed animal. 
In addition to understanding frame size, we also want to think about muscling and muscle thickness. And so this is one of the things in, in our beef breeds, we want to be in that number one or number two uh, muscling score. So again, this is something that, you know, uh, we need to look at from the genetics. Uh, if we're raising our own, doing our cow-calf to finish, uh, what can we do to enhance that muscle thickness and muscle score um, when we're, we're selecting calves? Um, so again, this is going to be something that's going to help with the, the yield and the finish um, amount on that animal. Uh, and so again, providing the quality and the, and the quantity size cuts that our consumers are looking at. In the next slide here, we just have, again, some examples here on some live animals. And so we can look at, you know, the triangular shape. Those are, tend to be more of our dairy or dairy cross animals. Uh, as we get in the center there, we have a, a beef steer. Um, and to the, to the right there, that Charlet steer that's a little thicker muscled. Uh, again, those animals, um, muscling, thinking about muscling is separate from, from fat finish, but those animals that are with more muscle are going to stand a little bit wider. Uh, and again, they're just going to have more uh, meat uh, to finish with. They're going to be thicker throughout. We'll shift to some of the things on the carcass quality. And again, there's, you know, kind of going through this quickly, but we are going to provide you some additional resources to look through um, because certainly it's one thing to look at pictures, but it's also important to, to get your hands on. Uh, and if you have the availability with working with your processor uh, to actually go in and look at your carcasses after looking at your live animals, that's going to be a helpful tool for you as a producer in order to know what are my animals doing, what do they actually look at like um, on the rail uh, after I've looked at, you know, thinking I'm doing a good job uh, on the hoof. So certainly some things that can uh, impact meat quality would be stress. So again, uh, that might be that uh, animal that's a little bit uh, stringy or str um, disposition, uh, you know, trying to avoid those kind of animals. But we can also have stress in how we handle so good quality handling facilities, uh, having a good setup for when we have to load animals out to take to the processor, um, managing them so that it's not the first time they travel in that direction. So that's some of the things that were pointed out earlier in um, you know, the BQA uh, tools that we talk about, certainly our handling and management systems. Uh, so avoiding things like the, the photo there to the far right, which shows some damage to the loin uh, you know, from animal bumping. Uh, if we have horned animals, we can have damage, so defects to the carcasses. Uh, those are things that, you know, end up with, you know, having to be cut out, uh, or again, it might uh, be affecting a, a high um, value uh, cut in the, in the carcass, and certainly things we want to avoid. Um, so some of the other things that, you know, we need to understand is um, uh, our carcass measurements. These are things that we can, again, work with our local processor on. Uh, if you're selling uh, by quarters and halves, then you're probably selling based on that hot, hot carcass weight. Uh, but the reason we measure things like ribeye area is that it's, you know, a good correlation or indication of the overall yield of the carcass. So we want to have a decent size ribeye area. Um, and that is something that, again, is, has to do with genetics. So um, if you're not looking at your carcasses and you're not looking at the animals you're raising, are you um, getting, uh, moving towards the direction that you want to have? Uh, marbling score, this is an indication for palatability. And so again, this grading, um, I should step back. Grading is something that for meat and poultry is actually a uh, paid service through uh, USDA. But there are some, um, some extension staff in the state that have been trained to do grading that can help you at least look at your carcasses and evaluate them, although they wouldn't be officially stamped as a grade. Uh, but also good indicators. So the other thing we want to avoid uh, is things like dark cutters. So that is um, another indicator uh, that could be something that's caused by stress um, that's different than uh, meat that's darker based on the maturity of, of the carcass. So we can also get uh, darker meat or darker cuts with animals that are finished at a, um, or more over mature over 30 months or, or get into uh, increasing age where there will be also a change in the color of both the muscle, but also sometimes the fat or the fat color will change. So these are, again, these are some measurements that are used to help you understand what is it that you're taking to the processor and are you giving a, con a consistent product back to your consumer? 
So, which is equally important whether or not you are selling individual cuts or you're actually, um, you know, again, selling quarters and halves to producers or excuse me, to consumers. So the next slide, um, this has an indication, these are um, the grading cards that are used. And so we're looking at the internal marbling. Um, internal marbling is again, an indicator of palatability. And so it's important to think about um, the, you know, again, who is your customer? What are they looking to have? So, you know, are they looking for the slight amount that would be a, a, a select carcass, um, uh, less marbling, less internal marbling there. Uh, when we get into the um, choice categories, that would be the small, modest, um, and moderate. Um, so the, the two uh, top to the center and, and right and the bottom uh, left, those are low choice, meaning, or, you know, choice and high choice. So I remember I, going back to those framed uh, scores where there was, you know, a significant uh, difference in weights. So obviously the, you know, the lower end uh, of those weights based on frame size is what the difference is between having a low choice uh, or high choice carcass. Uh, so that would, you know, again, be an indicator of the amount of finish that you're going to have in that meat. Uh, although there is also some genetics that go along with marbling in addition to, to just feeding and size. So the next slide here, um, thought we'd have a couple of questions just to interact with the group. And so, um, oh, I guess we have a poll coming up here. So which animal um, would you expect to have a larger ribeye of these two here, number one or number two, to have the larger ribeye area, looking at those uh, carcasses? And the second question would be, um, which of the two appears to be more overconditioned? So again, just some physical characteristics or things that we can look at in animals. So if you, um, you know, guess that uh, again, we would expect the larger ribeye area to be in the animal on the uh, left, the number one animal. Uh, again, the larger frame, a little bit longer bodied. Um, appears to be more, you know, muscular. Uh, although we're not getting a, 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 you know, direct from behind, but we can see a little bit more width there. And then as we look at the number two animal, uh, we can see that it, again, it's a shorter, shorter bodied um, and appears to have um, quite a bit of extra fat cover there. Uh, so that would be the one that uh, is over conditioned. So just a review, this one, I'm sorry, Catherine. So just to review the answers. The yes, the answer for the larger ribeye would be number one. And the uh, one with the over conditioning is number two. Here we're looking at the um, ribeye area of the two steers that were in the previous um, frame. And we can see that, uh, again, with the um, number one steer, it definitely did have a larger, significantly larger ribeye area. Uh, and again, um, you know, ribeye area is one of the things that's an indicator of yield uh, for the overall carcass. And so if we look at um, the uh, number two steer uh, being, first off, the, uh, it's a standard, so it has less internal marbling. So the uh, internal marbling or the, the, uh, is the fat that gives a, uh, more taste. Uh, and then when we have the, uh, looking at the cut to the right there in the number two, we have a lot of um, excess back fat. And so that uh, is gonna be waste. So when we're looking at um, what the, what's gonna go into the consumer uh, freezer for selling you know, um, quarters and halves, or what's gonna go on the plate uh, at the restaurant, there's gonna be a lot more trim uh, on that uh, second steer than on the first. Plus we're gonna have you know, a smaller ribeye area. And so what is the, you know, is that gonna meet the restaurant standard perhaps with a you know, again, the freezer trade, that um, small ribeye uh, may be adequate. Uh, but the other difference there too is that we put on a lot of extra fat on that second steer. And, um, you know, fat is expensive to put on. So we don't wanna be uh, putting external uh, or a lot of extra fat on an animal uh, if that's gonna be uh, waste or trim. Uh, and we're, or even if we're, you know, getting a choice or a high choice grade and we're not getting paid a premium for that. 
So there's a couple of different reasons for making sure that we have an idea how to assess the finish uh, of, the, of the carcass we have. Next one here is just a, this is a, um, uh, the, to, to uh, identify yield grade. Uh, again, these are some things that you, you know, without looking at the carcass, you're, you're not gonna have these, um, these uh, this information. So the yield grade, it has a calculation that goes with it. So the BF stands for the back fat. So back fat is an indicator we wanna have um, between 3 tenths and 5 tenths of an inch of back fat. Again, if we have excess um, back fat there, that's gonna be trim and waste. Uh, and it's going to, you know, it's not going to have a positive impact on the yield grade. Uh, KPH stands for kidney, pelvic, and heart fat. Um, that is an indicator, again, of um, the finish level. Uh, generally, that's about two and a half uh, percent, anywhere from two to three percent of the carcass weight. So we don't want to have an excess amount there as well. Um, the hot carcass weight uh, is what HCW stands for. And then the um, last there is the ribeye area. And so these are all um, measures that can be taken uh, of the carcass to determine what the percentage of um, the heart carcass weight is going to be that's going to go into the box. So again, that has an indicator for the, the value uh, that the, the customer is going to get if you're selling, um, you know, again, the, how much cutability, what is the amount of meat that's actually going to be available for the consumer. And so we want to have some consistency in that too. Uh, you know, we don't want to sell somebody a, a quarter this year that has, um, you know, a yield grade uh, significantly different than they got in previous year. That's one of the things that customers don't understand. And if we're not um, taking some involvement in measuring, you know, the animal that we're taking and the, and the cuts that we're, uh, we're selling directly, we may not know um, what that yield is uh, for, the, for the animals that we're taking. So the next thing we wanted to talk about, there's certainly been a lot of conversation about um, livestock processing. And if you're currently selling beef, you've probably, you may have come across some challenging and scheduling dates. Uh, if you're new or thinking about it, uh, it's certainly something that's important to consider. Uh, we may now be looking at, a, at a, a time where, you know, we're certainly not going to be scheduling out for the animal, uh, the mature animal there on the, on the left. Uh, if we haven't planned for that, um, we're probably not going to find a a place for that animal in the short term. Uh, we may be able to plan for that yearling that's in the center uh, and be able to get into a processor uh, within the time that we need, but we may also be looking at needing to schedule our dates uh, when that calf is on the ground or, or newly on the ground before even weaning. And so there are some tools that are available uh, to help us kind of estimate the live weight uh, that would be finishing for our animal. Next slide. So again, this, this is a calculation that we can do. It's relatively easy um, to do. We have a couple of things that we need to have. Uh, the date of birth of the animal, or at least a relative idea of when the animal was born. And, and certainly we should be keeping track of that if we're raising these animals um, on our farm. Uh, if you're buying in animals, you may not have the exact date, but you should be able to estimate or get an idea. The other uh, indicator that we're gonna need is a hip height. Uh, in order to do this, we need to have a, a flat surface where we can handle the animal. Um, it's you know, going to be much more accurate uh, if the animal is squared up and we're able to uh, get a good measurement. Uh, and then obviously the age is the, of their hip height age is the date that we take that measurement. And again, these are, um, these are measurements that are used to um, come up with a frame score and to ultimately uh, determine the finish weight uh, of that animal at low choice. So next slide. So this example here is with the steer um, and the formula that's uh, included here. We actually will share out, uh, if you aren't familiar with this, um, we, we can send it out as an Excel sheet where you can just plug in uh, the data and it will automatically calculate the weight. Uh, so this particular steer was born uh, May uh, 5th of last year. Uh, the hip height measurement, uh, which was done um, last week, uh, was 51. Uh, that calculated his age uh, that uh, was 521 days and it estimated the finish weight at low, low choice again for the steer would be 1135 uh, which would put him in the medium frame uh, steer. 
Uh, his current weight, you can see on the scale there, was 946. Uh, so that gave us a difference of 189. Uh, if I was projecting a finished date of January um, 4th, that would give me 88 days, which means I, that steer needs to gain an, uh, over two pounds a day in order to get him to that estimated finish weight. And again, this is an indicator. Obviously, if I want higher than low choice, I need to be you know, finishing that steer a little bit um, uh, at a little bit higher weight. You can do this both with the scale. I mean, obviously, if you have that availability to you, that's more accurate. Um, you can use weight tapes. Uh, if you're using a weight tape, you just need to have some consistency in, in how you're applying that, and you need to understand a little bit about um, body condition scoring as well, because tapes will have uh, multiple indicators uh, based on um, the body, uh, body condition score in addition to uh, the diameter around the, the chest. So again, this isn't, you know, this isn't something that is um, exact, but if you do this re um, repeatedly, so I will share that I did this um, uh, example or, or estimate with this steer uh, a year ago at weaning, and the estimated finish weight came out to a 1110 pounds. So that's about 25 pounds difference. So it is a fairly good indicator and it is a way to give us an idea of how much we need to have those animals gaining in order to make sure we get our finish weight. So next slide. Here's just an example for the heifer. And again, uh, we will provide the, the Excel sheet um, uh, that will allow you to do this calculation uh, rather than doing it longhand. Uh, for this example, I did actually fill in those figures. And so what I came out with for this heifer was a finished weight of uh, 941 uh, approximately pounds. One thing that with the, um, this tool, uh, when it was shared by Mike Baker with uh, our group when we were doing a hoof to rail, uh, his recommendation was to add 50 pounds for heifers. Uh, I've been using these for a number of years and I have found that that extra 50 pounds uh, is, is more accurate for heifers for whatever reason. I'm not sure who actually came up with the formulas, uh, Mike may have an idea who, who, uh, who uh, came up with that, um, but uh, it does work and it is a pretty good tool. Uh, again, you need to be able to handle your animals. You have to have a, a safe area to handle them uh, as well as a flat area in order to make sure you're getting some accurate um, hip height measurements. Um, that certainly can make a difference uh, if you're not doing that. So with this uh, heifer example, uh, she's currently 870 pounds. If I needed that to get to that 992, I'm looking at about uh, you know 1.4 pounds average daily gain to that harvest date. Next slide. So where are some things that we can look at for finish uh, on our animals? If you you know again that um, tool of using um, you know estimate uh, might be a good way to to get you started if you're not able to uh, do that. Uh, you know, the other thing as we're getting closer, we can look at uh, things like the tailhead area is probably one of the indicators where we start to see some fat there. Um, looking at um, brisket uh, and the chest area. And so uh, brisket is sort of something that we see more of in our, our, our English breeds of the Angus and the Hereford, um, not quite so much in the British breeds. So again, knowing what, um, what fits for your, the type of animals you have but certainly the tail head fat, again, um, uh, the rib area, is it smooth as you run your hand over? Uh, uh, the flank area, we'll see some fat deposit occur in there. With heifers, um, from behind as you lift their tail, uh, they'll actually have what's called a rope fat as they get finished. And so it's kind of uh, almost looks like a braid from uh, below the vaginal area uh, down through the center of their legs uh, as they start to finish. Uh, again, you know, those are good indicators, but if we've had to plan uh, far enough advance, we really can't wait until uh, we see that that animal is finished to scheduling our, to schedule our process dates. Um, but it may be something that you're using if you're going to indicate when you want to ship animals uh, to the livestock auction. So next slide. Um, again, we'll kind of circle back around to what kind of facilities or what you need. Uh, so certainly, if you need to have USDA inspected facilities, that might create, um, that may reduce the uh, 
a number of processing centers close to you uh, that uh, you'll be able to take animals to. So USDA would be required, again, if you want to do individual cuts, uh, you want to sell them at the farmer's market, you want to sell them to a local restaurant, um, you know, then you're, you must have the USDA inspected uh, label. You want to sell out of, you know, move through state, interstate commerce. So, um, you know, it has to be uh, USDA. If you're going to, again, stick with the, you know, the um, quarters and halves, uh, then you can do the um, state inspection uh, and that may open up some of the processing uh, options for you. But there certainly are other things to consider uh, when you're choosing a processor, so the distance. Uh, and again, there may be some choice in that, how far you have to travel. Uh, something to think about is the capacity. So are you taking one animal at a time or if you wanted to take five animals at a time, would they be able to handle that number? Um, do they have a, an ability to um, you know, hang the carcass? And so the time that you might want to hang that carcass, uh, or will they actually age just primal or primal cuts? So, um, so one thing on aging the carcass or hanging the whole carcass, you need to make sure that you do have some adequate finish uh, on that animal. So um, you get much past 10, 10 days or so, or you start to take that out, if you, especially if you don't have a good back fat or finish. Um, you know, you may have excess shrink on that carcass um, that has to be trimmed that dries out. So um, some facilities may actually be willing to age just the, um, you know, the loin uh, in order to um, impact the tenderness there. The type of packaging is something also to consider. Uh, and it may be also, um, you know, uh, vacuum sealing seems to be what people want, particularly if you're doing retail cuts, people want to see what they're getting. Uh, I do find that the double wrap, like the um, Saran and, and butcher paper, uh, has a longer shelf life for most uh, um, home freezers. And so that might be something to consider if you're selling uh, more freezer trade. Some of the things that facilities might be willing to help you with is assistance in developing a label. So if they're a USDA facility, they may actually help you um, develop that label and, and send it off to the regional office to be approved. Um, the other thing that might be important is, will they weigh in price and label? Um, that's, you know, again, there's going to be any cost associated with that, but if you don't uh, have that done at the processor, then you will, you know, you want to sell by cuts, you'll need to invest in, in a scale. Uh, and then it might be, you know, preference for value added meats or other products that they can offer. And, or will they do specialty cuts if you have a particular uh, customer or restaurant that wants um, certain types of cuts. So I think with that, um, we will again, there's a couple of other tools that we want to share with you. And there are two videos that were developed um, uh, through the Cornell Smile Farms program and um, Mike Baker, the extension beef specialist. One is on determining readiness of live animals and the second is on carcass evaluation. Uh, and again, I will we'll share those links out and encourage you to look at those if you're not familiar with them. And um, going forward, I encourage you to you know, have a conversation with your processor and, and spend the time if you are able to, uh, to get in and, and look at the carcasses uh, in addition to the live animal that you're delivering. And with that, I'll turn Great. it over to Catherine. Well, thanks, Lynn. Nancy, are there any questions right now for Lynn before we move on to some of the post-harvest decisions? No, nope, we okay. haven't had any come in. If you have any questions come in, feel free to um, type them in the chat, but we will hopefully have some time at the end um, before you all hop off to answer any questions you might have as well. So when we start thinking about post-harvesting uh, decisions, Lynn and Nancy and I really focused on truth in marketing and how important it is for us to be connecting with our customers um, and, and sharing with them what it is exactly we do on our farm. In my experience from working with uh, lots of different consumers and, and talking to them about beef, I really find that they, they just have a lot of questions and there are so many different labels out there. There's so many different marketing terms that it can be uh, overwhelming just as a farmer to decide what label you should be using uh, to market your products, but even more so for that customer at the other end um, for them to understand. And so what I've really found is that they are looking to 
Um, if they're coming to you to buy beef, they are looking to make a connection with you as the farmer. And I would lead with that. And I would lead with being as honest and as transparent as possible in order to build that relationship that's going to get them to keep coming back. Um, and so if you have already developed your marketing materials, I would have you take a step back and look at those and see which labels are really important to you as a farm practice, which ones do you really want to be sharing um, with your customers and making sure that you're being authentic and um, really truthful in, in what labels you decide to include. Some that I would draw some attention to. Um, I know when I showed this slide, one of the first ones that always jumps out on the farmer side of things might be this hormone free, right? We can't say that beef is hormone free. It is a uh, living, breathing animal that then turns into beef. Um, so there are hormones that are involved. And so we wouldn't be want to use the no hormones or hormone free. What we would use is the no hormones administered. Um, and again, this has to be something that has to be proven. So you can't just throw it on there. We have to have documentation on our end um, to be able to utilize that label. Some of the other labels that really come up and cause a lot of confusion, um, maybe the non-GMO label is one that I get a lot of questions about, right? There's no such thing as non-GMO beef because there's no such thing as GMO beef. GMO, there's not a GMO beef product. Um, obviously, as a farmer, what you're referring to is whatever feeds that you're feeding that animal. But making sure that, is that something that really needs to be on your label or is that a discussion that you could have um, so that it's not misconstrued and how important is it to you and to your customers um, to really have that information or are we just throwing information out there that isn't necessarily in our favor of really communicating who we are as farmers and what our farm stands for. So I would think about what is the most important labels to you and make sure that those are the ones that you are um, really including as opposed to just throwing uh, plethora of labels on there just because you can. So another thing that we want to be really careful of when we're marketing is our nutritional claims. Beef is a powerhouse when it comes to nutrition and we have a great story to tell. Um, we have a lot of, beef has a lot of great characteristics um, and qualities and nutrients. And so we want to highlight that when we're talking to our customers. We want to really drive with what beef strengths are. This is a great infographic to be shared, uh, whether you're at a farmer's market or you're sharing it online, um, to talk about beef's top 10. And when we're communicating about beef's uh, benefits, we want to be sharing that beef is high in protein. Um, and what do these things do for the body and why is that so important that you make sure that you're mixing beef in with other proteins? We want to be sure too, I mean, it is, um, it is great to be able to share what beef is and we might get questions about how beef compares to other products, especially, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion nowadays about alternative proteins or um, plant-based proteins. And so if we get questions about that, we can talk about it. We can have a comparison of what our beef's quality is as a, compared to other proteins or these alternative proteins. But I wanna just drive home how mindful we need to be, again, in being as authentic and um, transparent as possible, right? If you are comparing your product to another product, first off, consumers not, might not necessarily, or your customers might not really respond that great to that. A lot of times we want to just lead with what we're good at. So as a farm, you can lead with what you is, what you're strong at, as opposed to um, trying to put down another farm or another protein or another product. Um, but if you're going to do this side to side comparison or you get questions on it, I would be sure that you are actually in fact doing a side by side comparison um, and that you're comparing products that you're actually sharing. So for example, this infographic is uh, based on ground beef that's 93% lean and 7% fat. Many of you might not be getting ground beef that um, is that fat percentage. And so we want to be using the information that really represents what the product is that we're offering and we're sharing. So I would just be 
really mindful of that when you're going to share things or talk about things um, that we are basing it on things that we can truthfully share. Another thing that I want to be mindful of or remind you to be mindful of is that um, we talked about beef's great. It's got a lot of, of fantastic nutrients, leading and protein and iron, and those are fantastic things. Something that I see many farms sharing or um, I get a lot of questions on the consumer side about because at some point it was incorporated into beef marketing is omegas. If we go back a little bit, you'll see that there is no discussion of omegas on this infographic. And that's because beef is really strong in a lot of things, but omega-3s and omega-5s are not that thing. <laughs> that's not our, our strong point. If, if someone's looking to increase their consumption of omegas, they're going to be wanting to have nuts and salmon and avocado um, and olive oil as opposed to beef. So why would we highlight that? Well, let's lead with our strengths. Let's lead with what um, why they should buy from you as an individual farmer, as opposed to, you know, trying to throw these marketing claims out there. I would also advise you that right now, nutritional labeling um, for raw beef or for a single ingredient, uh, raw meat is voluntary. So you're not required to include that in your packaging. However, once you start making nutritional claims on your labels or, um, that's when you're going to start opening a door that that actually gets rid of that exemption and, and you're going to have to be looking to adding that labeling. So we want to be sure that we aren't um, triggering this mandatory labeling by sharing nutrition information where it doesn't need to be and where it's not, um, I guess, a claim that we really have to be including. Same goes for our grading. Lynn mentioned a little bit earlier about um, how grading is a USDA service, right? So, and correct me if I'm wrong, if any of you are going to a processor that um, is offering USDA grading, but many of our smaller scale processors here in New York do not offer this service. Um, it is an additional fee and it is not like vegetables, right? You can't go home and grade your own beef. Although we're all proud of the finish that we're putting on our beef, we want to make sure that we're not including a label and breaking ourselves into jail without a better term. Um, I don't think everyone's going to cart you off to jail for using this term, but still you're, you're not, shouldn't be using this product or this labeling claim um, if you aren't in fact having a USDA inspector. So be sure if you have already developed some marketing materials to go back and review and make sure that we're not including this in it. And if you are developing new materials, make sure that you are mindful of the fact that, you know, if you're using select or choice or upper two thirds, any of those kind of um, claims have to be based on USDA grading. So learning a little bit more about label development um, this is something that, as Lynn mentioned, you might want to ask your processor about. They may be able to help you with it. Um, there's some great resources in here. Small Farms has developed a great resource. And then going straight to FSIS because they are the regulatory agency when it comes to these labeling requirements. So I would be mindful in making sure that we are um, that we are including everything that we need to include. So those are two resources that I would definitely send you to. Uh, safe handling instructions are required. That's hopefully something that your processor is helping you work on um, if you are selling raw product. So some positives, those are some things that we maybe don't wanna include in our labeling claims, but we have great things that we can be including. So that might include some value added certification. I mentioned earlier that beef quality assurance can be used in this way. I have many farms that work with the beef quality assurance program to include this in their marketing. On the national level, we found that customers and consumers in general, really respond positively to the idea that such a certification program exists. Um, not only for you as a farm, it's a great story to tell, but as an industry as a whole, it's really reassuring that we have farmers that are investing their time um, to get the education, to follow the principles, 
and to really put the work in to make sure that they're producing the highest quality beef. Um, obviously, we know that most all farms are doing this, but having this certification really helps you tell that story and highlight that dedication. So that is a product that, or a label that you can use to help share that, and I would definitely encourage you to do so on your social media, on your website, any pamphlets that you have, you can include that certification label. I mentioned earlier uh, New York Grown and Certified. So New York State does have a Grown and Certified label that you can also use, and it's starting to become more and more familiar um, by our New York residents that they'll see this label on different products. There is a special certification just for beef products, and um, you can look into that. Actually being Beef Quality Assurance Level 2 certified is part of getting that certification. You'll also need to work with your local soil and water to make sure that you have an AEM plan um, because as part of this label, you're showing your dedication to raising in New York State animal welfare and um, environmental well-being and conservation. So if you are interested in either, either of those two labels, I can send out some more information. Um, but that's something that can help you highlight your story, right? Your commitment as a farm to uh, doing the right thing. And then when we're talking about marketing, we want to make sure that we are um, providing value to these customers and that we are um, not only providing a product at a price that is, is respected to them, but also respecting our time um, and the dedication that you're putting into getting this animal to finish. And so we wanna make sure that we are um, marketing at a price point that makes sense, that we can move that product, but at the same time, we're not giving it away, right? So if you're at a phase that you are just trying to figure out um, if you're finishing your first group of cattle and you are trying to understand how and at what price you should be marketing them, I would encourage you to go visit some of the resources at the Meat Suite website. There is a calculator that was developed by Matt LaRue. Um, he works with Cornell Cooperative Extension and it was funded by some SARE research, I believe, um, to make sure that this this could come to fruition and, and be a useful product. So if you're at that phase, I would definitely go visit that. Or even if you're marketing right now, I mean, making sure that you are getting the value um, for the beef that you deserve is really important. So as I mentioned, one of my roles with the Beef Council is working directly with influencers. And I work a lot with local chefs and um, have a lot of them out to different farms and do a lot of work with them. And all of them want to buy local beef or at least have an interest or idolize the idea of working directly with a farmer. Um, but there's some barriers to doing that, right? And so as a farmer, we have to understand that. And it takes, it's all about relationship building and working with someone, um, whether it's a chef or a butcher, to make sure that they understand what your marketing model is, um, what it is, the products that you're marketing and, and how you might be able to forge a relationship or a business um, partnership to be able to move those carcasses. And so they want to buy from you, but obviously they're gonna love buying those steaks or they're going to love buying those middle meats. And they have to understand that um, when we're small scale farmers, we are selling the whole carcass, right? And so we have to be really mindful of that and try to build those relationships. And it's not impossible. I'm actually doing some work with uh, the Meat Hook, which is located down in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And they have their butcher shop and a small restaurant there and then just opened a new restaurant and it's all with New York beef and it's all whole carcass. That's the way they build their menu and that's the way they market to their customers um, so that they're able to work directly with local farmers. So it is possible to forge these relationships, but it does take some extra time. And we have to be um, mindful of that as farmers that you might end up with the chucks and the hamburgers and the rounds that are less desirable cuts. And if you are selling by the piece, you might have to get a little bit creative, but there's some opportunities there, right? You can do seasonal promotions. You can do you know, barbecue boxes or holiday boxes, um, beef bundles to try to pair some of those 
desirable cuts with some of those cuts that are a little bit harder to move in order to get customers to try some of those different cuts and also help move that product. You might also want to, as Lynn mentioned, ask your processor, is there any opportunities for some value added products? Maybe it's developing some sausage or um, maybe it's even as simple as marketing beef patties as opposed to large packages of ground beef and helping make our product a little bit more customer friendly and a little bit more um, easy for them to integrate into their family's meal planning. So I wanted to highlight really quick um, some of the resources that we have available. I've had a lot of farmers who are starting to use these when they go to um, the farmer's market or they're working with their customer. There are these great resources that are available to you. And one of my favorite is the Beef It's What's For Dinner website. If you're not familiar with this website, I would really encourage you to check it out. One of my favorite things is this butcher counter. There. Now, now it's up. Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so it, say you are marketing this chuck roast and um, we, are, we just talked about, Lynn just talked about all the different work and all the different um, characteristics and considerations that you put into getting this animal to finish. And then a customer goes home and purchases it and absolutely doesn't cook it the right way or overcooks it or um, doesn't have a good eating experience, not at your fault, but at the fault of their own preparation of the cut, that's obviously going to reflect back on the farm. It's going to reflect back on your beef and it's going to strain your relationship with that, with that customer. And so ways to help go above and beyond are to provide a great customer service experience. So there are some resources that you can share um, to make sure that they're going to have that positive eating experience and that they're going to become a return customer. So as I mentioned, I love this website because you can put in some of those cuts of beef that your, your customers might not be as familiar with or if they express that they aren't really familiar with. Um, you know, maybe they're really just use ground beef right now and now all of a sudden they're buying a quarter cow and, or quarter and they're going to be trying to experiment with a lot of these new cuts. This shows them how they should be cooking that um, gives them a little bit of that nutrition information, but also gives them res recipe inspiration specifically for that cut. And so this can be helpful as well when I said, you know, maybe you're going to do a bundle or you're going to do a special giveaway or sale that week on a certain cut to try to move some of those less desirable cuts. Why don't you partner it with a recipe that can help make it easier for them to approach that cut for the first time? And so this is a great resource, whether it's something that you can pull up and have on a phone or an iPad, or it's something that you print out and give um, when they come to pick up their beef or have available. This is a great place to send them to. We also have um, on here, you know, just endless recipes. And as I mentioned, lots of different cooking information so that they're not gonna take that chuck roast and try to throw it on the grill or something totally silly and, and not have a good eating experience. And then the one last final tool that I just wanted to highlight really quick that can really add value as well is, um, is Chuck Knows Beef. And this is a resource. So Chuck Knows Beef is a great resource um, because I actually have some farmers that will bring it to the auction or bring it to the farmer's market or send their customers there um, because Chuck knows everything. So for your customers that have a home, Google Home or an Alexa or anything like that, they can say, hey Alexa, open Chuck knows beef and, and then say, hey Chuck, how do I cook this Chuck roast? And Chuck will give them step-by-step -step instructions on um, a recipe and how to cook that. And so it just makes it, again, providing that added value 
um, that they might not be getting from the grocery store and they're getting it as a special gift from you um, or a special tip from you really helps build that relationship. We have some marketing materials on all of these resources and so I encourage you um, to reach out and integrate them into your marketing plan and, and your marketing outreach um, to your customers. So with that, I don't wanna to take too much of our time because we're um, getting to about an hour since we started. But yeah, I wanna thank everyone, Lynn and Nancy, thank you so much for your help. Um, especially Lynn, you put a lot into putting together this presentation and hopefully you all found value in it. Um, Nancy and I are going to be looking to do additional beef quality assurance, recertification and education opportunities as the year goes on. Some of them will be in person and some of them might be virtual like tonight. So um, I hope that you all found value in this and I am hoping to send out a survey to get some feedback and some input on what are other topics that you're interested in or have questions about. So um, we encourage you to fill that out and give us your feedback so that um, we can create some, some future opportunities uh, for everyone. So with that, I know it's almost nine o'clock, so we will let you all go, but thank you again. If you have any questions, please feel free to uh, reach out to us at Cooperative Extension or at the Beef Council.